Okay, good morning. So, my name is Cameron Trenner. I'm a pediatric hematologist at Boston Children's, and, and like Mike said, um, that doesn't mean much to this field. So, I learned nothing essentially about this field in my training as a pediatric hematologist oncologist, even at Boston Children's Hospital with the longest running, or certainly one of the longest running, vascular anomaly centers. It was a very isolated, pocketed field until we all started to get together over the last uh, decade, bringing some of the medical therapies uh, to bear. And I'm excited to tell you one of the stories today. Um, I don't have any relevant conflicts of interest, but I do want to point out a couple of things. One is I had a career change a few months ago. I now work for Novartis. So I'm in a pharmaceutical company four and a half days a week, and I spend a half a day a week doing what I've done for the last decade going back to children's and seeing patients on Friday mornings, exclusively patients with vascular anomalies. So I kept all the patients I've had, still see new patients. Uh, but most of the time I'm thinking about early drug discovery and new drugs. I'm not talking about any of that today, so not, none of this has to do with what I do at Novartis. Um, and Novartis doesn't make this drug. Um, and the work's been supported by the LMI and, uh, and others. So I want to tell the serolimus story. So first of all, Serolimus, serolimus, tomato, tomato, doesn't matter. If your doc says it differently, that's fine. Um, and give you a feel for serendipity and why that's okay. Tell you what we've learned, what we haven't learned, and then hopefully give you a lens on these conditions with serolimus and also with novel therapies. If it, if for the number of times in the next 20 minutes that I'm going to say, we don't really know enough about this question yet. I'll remind you from the beginning, serolimus was FDA approved in 1999, so 20 years is next year. We're more than 10 years in this field with this drug, and we still have a lot of I don't knows. So new drugs have a pretty high bar um, because of that. Um, so first I'll just back up and, and tell you a little bit about how um, folks who think about medical therapies were brought into this field and, and, um, and some of these ideas developed. Um, so when, when we learn about the whole spectrum of vascular anomalies, there are tumors and malformations. I would say that everything we're talking about today with some interesting dialogue about KLA maybe, um, all of them are in the malformation category. And what folks thought was that you were born with these or a predilection for these malformations. They were embryologic um, errors. Now we understand often genetic errors in the endothelial cells that line vessels. Um, and that you lived with them. And you had complications along the way. And we would help you with them as they came. But it, the dogma that when I entered the field was medicine doesn't really work for those. It works for tumors. So you're an oncologist. Think that way. We have drugs that target blood vessels, we have drugs that target tumors that grow, um, but, but they may not work so much for malformations, and we've really flipped that uh, concept in the last few years. Um, but as when we just sort of came into the field, okay, great, what are we targeting? So I, I, I'll pause to emphasize this sort of uh, as, an, as an important unknown, because only in retrospect can we tell you where PI3 kinase or PIK3CA mutations now make the serolimus story in part make sense? We didn't know it at the beginning. We got lucky. Um, and sometimes that's what it takes and that's okay. But it's really important when we get to this afternoon and we start to talk about the science and the new genetics, um, we have incredible enthusiasm about that in our field because that's how we're going to pick new therapies with intelligent design and not just good luck. Um, I don't think I'm going to read through all of that um, other than, well, maybe I'll make a point or two. Let's see. What's working for a pointer? This? Oh, it's just small. Can you see it? I can't see it. Um, no, that's not going to work. So um, a couple of points. So reading down the left, uh, we'll spend a lot of time here. Um, Serolimus, obviously, is the, is the main thing. There are other drugs that block things in the pathway that was alluded to yesterday. I'll come back to that. The top right is the next talk. How do you block bone turnover with bisphosphonates? Um, I don't know if we'll talk about denosumab in that setting or not, but we can later. Um, 
I think this sort of helps to pull it together. So there are a bunch of, uh, a bunch of us have slightly different versions of the same fundamental concept, which is a slide that takes a bunch of molecules and signaling pathways that have to do with blood vessel growth, and now use, uses the simplified version of that to tie together our diseases. It was said yesterday, um, or alluded to, I guess perhaps better, that um, many of these genes, and in fact many of the same mutations that we see in this field are also found in cancer. None of the things we're talking about here are cancer, or to our knowledge have cancer predisposition, which is actually quite interesting. Um, but the fact that there are mutations in cancer means that companies have been working on drugs for these mutations for 10, 15 years, which is pretty cool. Um, and now there will be opportunities to try to take advantage of some of that. Um, I put GLA and KLA and lymphatic malformation in on this with RAS and PI3 kinase. Um, but down here on the right, mTOR is what serolimus blocks. So all of the mutations that occur in this field, nobody really quite said this yesterday, are activating mutations. Uh, they increase signaling through this. So the idea that you could use an inhibitor in a, in a cascade sort of um, signaling pathway like this is why serolimus in part probably works. Um, but it does beg the question, what happens if you blocked farther upstream and used an AKT inhibitor or a PI3 kinase inhibitor? Uh, or on the other side, a MEK inhibitor or a RAS inhibitor. Um, so I think those are, those are questions to come. So why serolimus? So let me tell you a couple things about serolimus. I mentioned it was FDA approved in 1999, so we're coming to the 20 year point for experience with the drug. And that experience did include kids, and that was one, definitely one of the reasons that that was uh, open. Um, I'll tell you a couple other fun factoids about serolimus. So serolimus, um, also sometimes referred to as rapamycin. They're actually slightly different, but rapamycin has the name because uh, this compound was isolated from soil uh, bacteria on Easter Island, and locals call Easter Island Rapa Nui, so that's where the rapa comes from. So as it turns out, for millions of years in evolution, bacteria and fungi battle it out in the soil. So most of our antibiotics come from fungi and most of our antifungals come from bacteria. And this was designed to be an antifungal, it's actually a decent antifungal, interestingly, but oops, it causes immunosuppression, which is not really great when you're trying to treat people with infections, so that was abandoned. And that side effect is now the main reason this drug is used for transplant. I'll throw in one other thing for, uh, uh, based on a paper that just came out three or four weeks ago, which is I think gonna be very interesting to our field, which is that in, um, in adults, it has now been shown that low-dose mTOR inhibition actually is not immune suppressing, it is immune building. So elderly patients get fewer infections on low-dose mTOR inhibitors um, than those not. So there's a lot yet to learn about what it means to modulate this, and that will come, I'll come back to that concept when I talk about dose. So why serolimus? This story was partially told yesterday. Um, in the discussion, it was because of this leg and this patient that was completely refractory to everything that was known. And in a tumor board at Cincinnati Children's, my colleague Denise Adams asked the question, what else can we do for this child? And somebody mentioned serolimus because there was some data in other lymphatic, um, in, in, a, in a rare pulmonary tumor disease called lymphangiolimomatosis. And because lymph was in the word for that, and this is a lymphatic-based tumor, um, and because there were some data in kids. It was thought about, here's the story for this patient. So this is platelet count, um, which is one of the manifestations of a severe complication of this tumor is thrombocytopenia. So you can see that there was absolutely no response to all of the first drugs tried. Steroids, vincristine, cyclophosphamide, interferon, avastin, and then when serolima started, there finally began to be a response. This is what happened to that patient's leg over years. And in Cincinnati, they have a rule, if something works once, you can call that innovative. You might do it two times, but no more than three. And if you get to three, you have to write a protocol. Um, so Denise did that. Um, uh, confirmed here on the slide now back in 2009. Whoops. Um, 
So that trial uh, was quite interesting. I'm going to run through it very quickly. It's talked about a lot. I just want to make sure that you have some familiarity with it because there are some patients with GLA and GSD and KLA in the study, um, but the trial was not designed for any specific disease. All they knew was three patients with different diseases had responded. That's all they knew. So they said, let's take a list of diseases, most of which have some lymphatic component. The only exception was P10, which is a, a different um, syndrome, but in the same pathway. And you can't just have a disease. You have to have a disease and something that can really benefit from therapy. You need to have some upside in order to take risk, because we're going to now give you this risky immunosuppressive drug that we don't know a ton about in this field, right? So there had to be some upside. So it was honestly, um, for both investigators, but far most, more so for the patients who participated, a, a very brave trial. Um, they made the decision that they were going to give equal weight to three different types of response. If your MRI is better, that's great. We'll give you credit for that. But if your quality of life's better, and that's the only thing that's better, you get credit for that, which you should. Everybody will agree. Um, and also, if, you're, if clinical criteria, functional response, um, got better. Um, I just will quickly point out the abbreviations. Um, PR is a partial response. PD is progressive disease. Um, from the top down, looking at 57 patients, about 85% had a partial response. About 15% progressed through despite serolimus. So it does not work for everything, um, an important takeaway. In terms of side effects, it's by and large tolerable. The only thing with multiple patients in it was suppression of the immune system. The white count was too low. Um, everything else was, were single events and single patients, only two patients uh, dose altered because of, um, uh, changed their serolimus dose because of side effects. Um, but this slide, I think, is where what we really wanted from this trial. We wanted to see, was it safe enough to do um, but now if we take the diseases and break them out and get out of what they, were re what they were called before and use more updated nomenclature, the diseases for this room are all, all up at the top. So there were seven patients treated with generalized lymphatic anomaly and seven for seven had some response. Um, there were two patients with Gorm syndrome, which is Gorm stout disease. That was a one out of two success, partial success. For seven patients with Kaposiform lymphangiomatosis, six out of seven had partial response, one got worse. Um, and then CCLA, which is this lymphangiectasia abnormalities of the central uh, conducting channels, three out of three did not respond, which is interesting. So from this we learned where should we place more emphasis in which diseases and where do we need other ideas? Um, so I, I think the tables are one thing. I'll just run through a very uh, a few number of other cases to sort of highlight this is a patient with that same tumor that Denise had initially treated showing another response. Here's a patient from the study whose pleural effusion did get better. It was asked yesterday, does serolimus help pleural effusions? Some, not all, but not all pleural effusions are created equal, uh, but it helped this one. Um, it also helped some bone disease. Um, I have been caught by a family in this room making predictions for their child about, oh, I think your effusion will get better, but I don't know what it'll do to bones. The effusions didn't get better, and the bones got better. Um, uh, I learned from every patient still to this day, um, but in this case, um, this was a patient where both had responded. Um, some patients with large lymphatic malformations get much better, like this young boy on the left. The older girl on the right didn't really change so much. Um, so again, we're, we're really still learning. Does it matter if you treat younger? Does it matter if you're heavily pre-treated and have all small cysts that we're trying to treat? She's smiling in the after photo, as people tend to do, um, because even though her mass didn't get better, her tongue got tremendously better. So from a quality of life, from a social implications for a school-aged child, for blood stains on the pillowcase that aren't there anymore, hugely beneficial drug, even though not much smaller. 
Um, I put this, this case in um, just to make a couple of points. So I loved that there was an entire talk dedicated to uh, the multidisciplinary approach or interdisciplinary approach. Um, uh, one thing that's very important to remember about what we know about serolimus is the vast majority of patients that have been treated to date were treated with other procedures and other things first. And then, we're, and then serolimus came into play. This is the first patient that we treated in Boston where serolimus came first. We all talked about it. Our, our surgical colleagues, our interventional radiology colleagues, we said, this is an easy one. It's outside the chest wall. Could easily be resected, as Juan Carlos showed yesterday. Big macrocystic lesion, easily sclerosed. But let's see what serolimus can do, and maybe we'll need to do less later. So serolimus was the first um, therapy given to this child. You can see the response to drug down through the lower right. Great, but not perfect response. Then um, Steve Fishman, my colleague in surgery, had a much smaller incision, much less work to do, a dry operative field. She's now growing up. Her scar looks fantastic, and she's growing into this extra skin in the front um, and didn't need to interfere with the breast bud and predict uh, any problems for breast development. So I think there are ample opportunities to talk not about drug or surgery or interventional radiology, but, but more and more opportunities to, to, to talk about and. So now I'm going to switch and talk about different data. So the data I showed you from the, from the phase two study was prospective data, highest quality data. Every patient was asked the same question the same way. Those are hard to do. They're expensive to do. They take years to do. Um, I think more real world data can come from just observation. Um, and the fact that, in, in fact, when I first came into this field, um, it was very quickly apparent to me that these diseases amongst complicated lymphatic anomalies were an area where where research was desperately needed, uh, and with the support of the Lymphatic Malformation Institute, we launched a registry in Boston that's been referred to, um, and I utilized that to go back and look at serolimus responses. We just presented this uh, in the spring at both ASFO and ISFO. So the, the motivation to gather all this data was that we didn't have um, enough, uh, uh, enough data. There was opportunity for collaboration, and we really wanted to improve our understanding of these diseases. Um, all we really knew about was a handful of case reports in that 57 patient prospective study. So we launched a, a registry in 2012. Uh, I forget exactly when I cut this data three or four months ago for those presentations, but 686 patients have been referred into the registry since we started it. Um, there is referral bias. We have far more complex patients than we do simple. Um, we looked at patients who, as of April 5, had been on serolimus for at least six months. If you're just starting, we didn't count that because you couldn't possibly predict um, what might happen down the road. Um, and in that, we have 134 patients who've been treated with serolimus um, for at least six months. Um, and we asked patients, did it work? And what, what toxicities do you have? So these are patient-reported outcomes, and that, I think, is probably the future of our field, but maybe not this way. Ideally, that would be done prospectively. Everybody's asked the same question the same way, so you, there is some what's called recall bias. What you remember um, is what you say happened. Um, here's the data for what was in the registry at the time that we pulled it. You can see the diagnoses on the right. Um, we have about, about a quarter of the registry are lymphatic malformations. Um, so there are 137 patients in the registry. 33 were included in this series of 114 GLA, 22 GLA patients included in this series. Gorham Stout, we have 56 in the registry. There were 16 who had seen serolimus for six months. CCLA, there were 12. KLA, there were 11. Um, so that just gives you a flavor of what are the patients I'm about to tell you about. On average, patients had started at age seven, but you can see the range from first month of life to 67 years of age. We kept track of patients on average um, till age 10. The median length of therapy was about two years. Six months was the lowest. 90 months was the longest. Um, and interesting and important for the next talk, about a quarter of these patients also on bisphosphonates. Um, 
because that simply boils down to do you have enough involvement of your bones that we think we should help to try to preserve them. The majority of patients, 84%, were treated with BID dosing, but there were a subset that were given a low dose initial um, uh, dose for serolimus. So what do the patients say they have for side effects? This is pretty um, similar to my experience. Um, and um, one in three, by far the most common, um, report mucositis or stomatitis, those sort of annoying mouth sores you get for a few days. Um, a little bit of discussion about the others you see listed here. Um, single digit percentage, I think, fits my clinical experience as well for headache, diarrhea, nausea, fatigue, and high blood pressure. Um, there are other things. Acne is real in, in age-appropriate uh, folks. Elevated cholesterol is real for sure. Um, and, and you can read the rest of the list here. By and large, this is well tolerated. I found it quite interesting that at the bottom, 39.6% of patients said, eh, not really much anything for a side effect. That sounds high to me in my clinical experience, looking maybe a little harder at the numbers. Um, but I, I think it does sort of give you a sense that most patients find this well tolerated. And did it work? So it depends on what the goal was, which is a really important message for this talk. So what was the predetermined goal? You'll see that patients often had more than one. What were the number of patients who had that goal? And then how did those do? So 23 out of 32 had improved bleeding. If you take stable bone mineralization, it was 10 out of 17. Pain was a little more than half. So they're ranked by how often they happened. So if you take stable bone mineralization and at the bottom improved bone mineralization where there were two, um, so we're a bit better than 60% um, for helping bone, completely confounded by the fact that a quarter of patients are also on bisphosphonates. So this isn't just serolimus. But if you look at swelling was better in half, transfusions were better in half, infections, so interesting, in an immunosuppressive drug were better in half. Um, and effusions, you can see stable or improved. If you count both, it's actually a very high number. But if you separate them, it's about 40% for both. Um, but it's not all. And quality of life was about one in three. So I'll switch now just to give some big picture. How do you, what, what are the things to think about if you're thinking about serolimus, that you could plug and play a different drug into, into, into many of these themes? So I'm often asked, how do I decide when a patient needs serolimus? Is it the gene? Is it the diagnosis? Or is it the chief complaint? It's the chief complaint. Because we don't often know genetics. We don't often enough know genetics. We're still learning about genetics. Um, and it is fueling enthusiasm of targeting this pathway. Um, but I don't think we can rely on that. And there are so many PIK3CA mutations that give very different diseases. I think, I think there are still some important questions to be answered. It can't be the diagnosis alone because we keep redefining the diagnoses. And that's, that's healthy discussion as we learn as a field. Um, but that's not enough of a reason for a therapy. And I just showed you on the last slide some complications respond better than others. And having a feel for that really is, a, is important for setting expectations. So I always aim at what is the actual problem the patient has. The phenotype is the medical word for the, the chief complaint. So yeah, the best target for therapies is the chief complaint. We have to weigh safety and efficacy. So when I think about a brand new cancer-designed drug now, that's got to compete with 20 years of data for an FDA-approved drug that I've used in an infant. Um, it can't be as safe as that, so maybe we're going to have to have patients who don't do so well on serolimus um, before we think about those drugs. Um, safety is different if you're going to try something for six months rather than it being a chronic therapy. Um, are, any, are the toxicities reversible? I didn't say that out loud, but in my experience, yes. I have yet to see a toxicity that I believe is related to serolimus that wasn't reversible when I lowered the dose or stopped the drug. Um, common versus rare, I'm very careful with the word rare in a vascular anomaly center. It means something different to the rest of you in the room now, doesn't it? Um, and efficacy. So for safety, I can talk about hundreds, maybe now thousands of patients with vascular anomalies treated with serolimus. 
For efficacy, you want to talk about a right-sided effusion in GLA because that's what's important to you when it comes to using the drug. Um, it is critical to establish goals together, family and physician or clinician, before starting therapy. What are they? Do you want fewer complications, better symptoms, smaller size, stable disease, prevention? Write, write it down. Literally, we write them down. Um, define how are we going to measure, is it better? Are we going to do MRIs in some serial fashion, in which case we need an MRI to start? But I don't treat MRIs, I treat patients. So I more and more don't do a ton of MRIs. I do them because it's interesting. I do them because when I go to meetings, I can show pictures and convince people. But I'm not treating based on the picture's better. I want to treat because a symptom's better um, in most cases. Um, but great photographs in clinic is critically important. Um, what are the patient reported outcomes you want to follow? And follow them systematically. Um, centers like Atlanta that just got built so intelligently with so much insight are going to have, I think you're going to lead our field in data because they're gathering systematic data on every patient from the beginning and they're a large center already. Um, and the last thing I'll say is expectation management because I have been burned badly in both directions on this. Um, I generally say I like to under-promise and over-deliver. Um, in the beginning, we promised nothing because we had no idea if this drug would work. And as it began to work, I showed you some pretty impressive responses. People's excitement and enthusiasm and expectations exceeded reality. So some of my best responses, one of the patients I showed today is exceedingly disappointed because they weren't cured. I never, I never said they'd be cured by the drug. It worked so well so quickly, their expectations got high quickly. Um, so just being really um, candid and direct in, in discussions about that with your teams, I think, is important. Um, dosing strategies. This is mine. Every, many are similar, but none are quite the same. But this is mine. And um, I'll tell you the rationale behind it. I start everybody fundamentally with the same dose that was in the trial. I don't aim for a trough of 10 to 15 because most of the toxicities were at the top of that. So I just sort of made up a range that was about the same that's a little bit lower. So I aim for 7 to 13. That served me well in terms of toxicity. Um, and most patients get started that way. If you're an adult, if you come in with lots of similar side effects, um, um, or I'm more concerned about toxicity, I might start on once a day or lower dose. Um, or if I'm trying to prevent, you have less to gain, you don't have a lot of symptoms, I might start lower dose. And neonate's definitely tricky to dose in. Um, we start about half, half the dose. My goal is to use that dose until whatever your improvement is has reached a new plateau. And once you've said twice to me, we're about the same, either with imaging or your own description of complaints in my exam, um, then I say, aha, that's your response. Now let's define the minimal effective dose to keep you there, because I want you on the lowest dose you need in case you need it for a long time. And many patients do need this drug for a long time. Um, I'm more and more reassured by that, um, and I will say to date there are not long-term, there are not data that, that raise new questions about long-term toxicity for use, um, but we remain pretty vigilant about that, and I like patients on the smallest dose they need to be on. Um, here's a list that I made distinct from that look at the registry. Um, I don't think there's much here that's not, um, that's not listed otherwise. I'll make a couple of comments on this one that I didn't make on the last one. Um, one is that the interaction with grapefruit is oh, very, very real. So read labels for mixed fruit juices and things like that. Um, you will not metabolize serolimus if you have grapefruit in your system and your level will spike and you'll, you'll know it usually with mouth sores. The other one that's coming up a little bit more lately, and the only real data for this is in um, rats um, is low sperm count. So there definitely are changes in menstrual cycles. While you're on drug, they reverse off of drug. I've had both women and men go 
um, women off of drug, men on drug go on to conceive and have children. So uh, I don't use the word infertility, but lower sperm count is a question raised. Um, so I, I just, I'm happy to talk about that. Um, infections, um, while most infections, the type of infections you get with lymphatic disorders are lessened, um, you can get pneumocystis, I do strongly believe, in prophylaxis. Um, here's my list of benefits. So uh, there are things that I'm not sure it helps. It doesn't help lipomatous overgrowth. I haven't seen it do very much for an arteriovenous malformation, a true one, uh, or for capillary malformations. I, I told you that three out of three central conducting lymphatic anomalies didn't get better on serolimus, but since that study, I've had several who do. So I don't know if we weren't treating the same patients, if you needed to treat a little longer. I think the truth is that like lymphangiomatosis used to be, CCLA is now a little bit of an umbrella or a bucket, whichever you look at it. Um, it's an imaging diagnosis that at times is, it may actually be its own disease, and at other times it's just an Im imaging characteristic of these diseases we're talking about. Um, and until we better understand who the responders are and not, I don't think we're going to tease that out. I think there are a number of remaining challenges for serolimus. We've used it to fix complications in refractory patients. What happens if you use it first? What happens if you use it to prevent? We really have no idea, um, though there are some interesting animal model data that suggest it works that way. What other diagnoses haven't we tried it for? How does it work? I can talk a good game about how it works, but we don't know. Um, is it just that it modulates the immune system and all the lymphocytes that are chapped, trapped in all the abnormal lymphatic tissues are driving disease? That's a different hypothesis. We don't really know how it works. Um, vaccine responses on serolimus. I think that vaccines respond, but I still don't let patients get live vaccines while on drug. How long do you treat is individualized? How durable is the response is a pretty big concern. That means if you stop drug, does it come back? Um, concerns with long-term use I, men I mentioned. And the truth is, we often use serolimus alone or add a bisphosphonate if the bones are really bad, or in KLA, if serolimus isn't enough, we might add vincristine or steroids. But we really aren't often doing multi-drug therapies. And in cancer, it's multi-drug therapies. And we learned that because one wasn't enough. Maybe what we've learned from serolimus is that's, that's great, but it's not quite enough. Um, uh, and multimodal therapy may be um, important. So I'll wrap up. Um, by saying, by and large, this is a well-tolerated drug, often effective, but depends on your complications. Decide what your goals are at the beginning. Um, and I really look forward to larger prospective studies, thinking about new medications uh, targeting elsewhere in the pathway. And I think, I importantly, I'll emphasize again, partnered um, studies of how do we um, utilize procedural therapies and medical therapies together. I'll also conclude by, stand, by stating that I stand on the shoulders of many um, before me and around me in Boston in a truly, um, if I can be semantic and channel John Mulliken, not multidisciplinary but interdisciplinary team. And what's intended as a semantic difference there is that multidisciplinary means you saw lots of different doctors from different specialties, but you might have been left to figure out what they all meant. Interdisciplinary means they all talked together and came to one plan with you. And that's our goal as a center. We don't always achieve it, but that's our goal, and I think it should be your goal for your teams, too. Uh, thank you.